Stu Gatz here. Whether you're into podcasts about ghastly crimes or hip-hop rhymes, there's always something new to discover on Spotify. With a mix of originals and many of the world's most popular shows, listening to podcasts on Spotify is easy. Just open the app, tap Browse, and dive into their growing library. Subscribe to your favorites, including our entire archive, so you'll never miss a show. You can also download podcasts for those moments when you're up in the air or going underground. Podcasts on Spotify are streaming right now. Go check them out today. With the City Double Cash Card, you get 1% cash back when you buy and 1% as you pay. That's like the joy of getting two W's on the road or catching the home run ball without spilling your drink. Double boom. Double the love with the City Double Cash Card. Apply now at city.com slash double cash. The Dan Levatar Show Podcast. The Dan Levitard Show with Stu Gatz on ESPN Radio and the ESPN app is presented by Progressive Insurance. Guests join us via the Shell Pins All Performance Line. You can tweet us on the 1-800-Flowers.com Twitter feed, at ESPN Radio and at Clinton Yates. That's me, filling in here on a holiday, live from the District of Columbia. What you heard right there, Mike Breen and Mark Jackson from ESPN TV, describing the little Donnybrook, if you will. It wasn't quite a Donnybrook. It wasn't even close to all of that. They touched foreheads. Uh, last night during the Thunder Warriors game. It was an interesting little ball game. It wasn't exactly, uh, it wasn't the most competitive game in the context of the score necessarily. Thunder won 108 91. But it was about as exciting as it was going to get for a game that I never really thought that the Thunder were going to lose. That situation that you just saw unfold between. Westbrook that you saw, that you heard unfold between Westbrook and Durant, I think it's pretty fair to say was honest. I saw people tweeting like, oh, it looks like they're just putting it on for show. I don't know about that. Let's hear what Royce Young, and ESPN NBA Thunder reporter, had to say about this on Izzy in Spain. The most Kevin Durant and Russell Westbrook talk to each other is the uh, little sequences of trash talk when they play against each other, because that's it. I mean, these two guys, um, there is no relationship between them anymore. And um, obviously that's kind of a sad thing. I mean, these guys spent a lot of time together, got very, very close, a lot of respect and admiration for the other. Um, but, you know, you can, you can see it on the floor tonight, the way just Russell Westbrook reacts um, to any time he's around Durant. Um, I mean, the guy just wants to annihilate him. And, I mean, Russell certainly holds a grudge. Now here's the question. In a real deal, what I like to call the hands community, who do you think actually wins that battle? Like if it came down to it, I know it's easy to say Russ, simply because he's a little more feisty. You're going to presume he's probably got a little heavier of a hand, if you will. But Durant's got a reasonable amount of reach on him. Something that you could see him expressing during that little situation. He was looking down upon him literally and physically. Which Russell clearly did not appreciate. Because the look on his face, if you see the highlight, was that, don't make me pop off, son. You're about, you're, you're, you're about to make me mad. He had that, you're about to make me mad. And if you make me mad, I can't be held responsible for what I'm going to do. He was acknowledging him. He had his ear to his mouth, but he wouldn't look him in the eye because he knew if he looked him in the face, it was going to send him over the edge and make him angry. Understandably, too, by the way. I'd still be ticked off if I was Russell Westbrook as well. Probably not fairly, but it would make sense. Let's hear what the NBA MVP had to say about last night. Play the same way every night. Um, If it's against Kevin, if it's against... We play Friday. Detroit. Detroit, Reggie Jackson, Dennis Smith on Saturday. It don't matter who it is. On the court, I don't got no friends. Only friend I have is a basketball. That's it. Um, and obviously my teammates. But I go out to compete. Um, I go out to play at a high level. Like I've been saying since day one, and that's what I do. Kevin Durant, Kevin Love, Kevin from that show on CBS, don't matter. Thunder's winning at home. That's basically what Westbrook is saying in that meme style. He doesn't care who's out there, but I don't believe that. You don't go face-to-face with a guy for no reason if you don't care who it is, but his point is correct. Westbrook brings that noise every single night. He just turned it up a notch last night for Durant and the Thunder. And it's, excuse me, in the Heat, with the Heat, the Warriors, and it showed. I mean, they outplayed them. It wasn't just a bad night for Golden State. The Thunder took it personally and it showed up 
in the box score. That was a fun game last night, a very fun game. Let's hear what Kevin Durant had to say on his reception back in Oklahoma City. It was a little better. I mean, nothing, it's not like the first time, so I'm sure everybody in the arena, you know, they say what they had to say. Was that tripping this life with you and Ross? Man, that's just ball, you know. It's just ball. He competitive. I'm competitive. We like to go at it, both of us, and that's just a part of the game. So I respect it. I got number love for it. So I'm expecting it again when we play him again, but it's for all funny games to me. I thought it was actually a very healthy, competitive environment. It didn't feel over the top hater raid style the way it did the first time he came back. Matter of fact, there were a couple of dudes in the crowd with some big old Kevin Durant, not bobbleheads, uh, fathead looking things. <laughs> and another guy had a sign that said, sorry, not sorry. Which is about where it should be. Thunder fans are over it, but they ain't forgotten it. That was the vibe I got. Now, we're not going to get into the whole concept of why it's not really about loyalty, but that's a different discussion. It was a very competitive NBA game last night, and it was the biggest win of the season, as far as I'm concerned, for the Thunder. Let's hear Durant, though. Things did get a little chippy in the post game with the press. There were definitely some pictures of, you know, Westbrook and Draymond, kind of a little clapping contest, you guys nose to nose. Seemed, seemed a little tense out there. Did you watch the game or you just tried to watch for the scuffles and the... Oh, no, I was watching the okay. game. I was watching... There's more than one story here. Oh, okay. The story is about the game. We lost. They kicked our ass. They played a great game. You should get them credit for how they play and we should be better. It's not about who in, who in each other's faces or... That stuff is not real. So please don't believe it. All the fans, they lying to y'all. That's, it's about basketball and they played a great game and we didn't. Mm-hmm. Mm, I'm supposed to believe that. Did you watch the game? First of all, that question is disrespectful to the reporter. Katie, come on, man. You're better than that. Why are you trying to act like y'all weren't literally touching foreheads at the free throw line extended? I mean, it'd be one thing if that didn't happen, but it did. So trying to act as if all of a sudden you too good to have a discussion about the fact that you and Westbrook don't get along anymore. Come on, fam. KD, we love you, but that don't make no sense. Y'all got lightweight worked by your former team on the night before Thanksgiving. It happens. I understand that. You're a little frustrated. But I love the reply she had right there. There's multiple storylines in a game. Hashtag, well, actually, playboy. We can think about more than one thing at once. Which is exactly right. Westbrook didn't exactly get revenge on Kevin Durant last night. But I'll say this. That was the win the Thunder needed to realize that they're for real this year. And not just another eight seed hanging around looking to lose to somebody. And at this point, I think Westbrook's got a little bit of the psychological advantage over Kevin Durant. Cash Moore of the Dan Levatar Show with his two guts. 10 to 1 Eastern on ESPN Radio and ESPN U. Another thing happened last night in the NBA, which was that LeVar Balls, Lonzo Ball, and his Lakers played against the Sacramento Kings. That was an interesting game. The Kings looked real good. Lakers looked okay. Lonzo's cut all his hair off, by the way, which is a much bigger deal in my life right now than anything going on with the actual team. Lakers looked all right. Lonzo probably had the dunk of the night, I would say. Caught a nice low lob. Banged that joint with one hand. But let's be honest with ourselves here. The story right now is not Lonzo and the Lakers in that family. It's LeVar Ball. LeVar Ball has been in a -a tete-a-tete, if you will, with the President of the United States of America. And the tweets have been flowing. And LeVar did an interview with CNN. And then something weird happened, which was that the president kept tweeting at him, doubling down on what he said, calling him an ungrateful fool. Here's the problem with that. Two things. Number one, ungrateful is basically code word for uppity 
which is code for stay in your place. Y'all know how I feel about stay in your place arguments. They're absurd. They're racist in nature. And by definition, are out of line. This is the United States of America where people are allowed to say what they choose without facing fear of retribution from their government. It's not the same thing as getting fired from your job for being a jerk. Let's be clear about that. But after all that, my colleague, Bill Plasky, who I know and I like, wrote this column. Headline, the big blowhard. LeVar Ball has made a living off the backs of his children. Bill, if you're listening, understand this. This is not a shot at you or anything personal, but this is a fundamentally flawed, and I would go so far as to say inappropriate argument in this situation, and I'll explain why. When it comes to how... Black folks raise families in this nation. We are often vilified as not being present enough. Not being involved enough. And oftentimes not being capable enough. To raise and build families the way that according to Hoyle we should. So. When you see a guy like LeVar Ball, who due to his own specific personality offends a lot of people's sensibilities, there's a tendency to tie in the notion that whatever his children may seem to achieve, understand, or want is somehow separate if they do not embody the exact same personality. That does not make sense. Because LeVar Ball is their dad. He is not doing anything off of the backs of those players as he is the one who taught them and provided them with everything they have to achieve what they have gotten so far. Now, I could get all into the concept of why we understand what the black body is worth in America And why people seem to think that there's something wrong with black folks taking agency in themselves and not buying into the system that is otherwise exploitative, also known as the American way. Go read a book. But I don't have to do that. Because you can just tell how offended people get when a black dad basically says, I don't need y'all's nonsense. I'll do it how I want. Because that is not how we've done things in this country forever. It's just not. Gordon Gronkowski wanted to put three kids in the NFL. Just because he wasn't a loud, screaming jerk, as some might put it, would you say that he wanted to build? Or he was you know, living off the backs of his children? Would you say that? No, you probably wouldn't. So this notion that LeVar Ball is somehow ungrateful because the president tweeted that he allegedly got his son out of jail is insane for two reasons. Number one, fealty is not a requirement of a functioning democracy. And number two... Trump doesn't necessarily know what he's talking about when it comes to the legal system in China. Okay? Let me read from a little publication that some of you might know as the New York Times. Shoplifting is considered a relatively minor crime in China. And foreigners convicted of minor crimes are often deported rather than given prison sentences. Quote. It's nonsense. End quote. Fu Hua Ling. I hope I'm pronouncing that name correctly. A law professor at the University of Hong Kong said of Mr. Trump's assertion that his intervention was solely responsible for the athlete's release. Quote. 
I would be surprised if they were even prosecuted, end quote. Oh, I'm sorry. Those on the ground who actually understand the internal working machinations of what goes on in Chinese culture and law don't seem to believe this was a big deal. So when LeVar Ball says it's not a big deal, hey, guess what? He's actually correct on that front from a legal standpoint. Now, it might be a big deal to you because you don't seem to want to understand why a brother would charge $500 for some shoes and $200 for some slides because that just doesn't operate in your particular brain framework. Meanwhile, I don't see you complaining about Gucci Aces being $500 because you probably didn't even know that because they're luxury goods for luxury bank accounts. The point is here is that LeVar was right about all this. And to stand up there and say that he is taking something off of the backs of his kids when he literally, physically, emotionally, and otherwise built and supported them, you're taking away the ability and the agency of a black family to support itself for itself, within itself, for themselves. And that's what's hard for a lot of people to understand. You can't have it both ways. You can't act like when somebody's not around because by the by the judicial system be taking brothers off the street left and right that all of a sudden they ain't enough fathers in the household and then turn around and say when a man builds an empire and tries his best to make sure his kids are in the best position to succeed at what they're good at that all of a sudden he's working off the backs of them. That isn't fair by definition. But then again, never was for black folks in America. And that's the whole point, kiddos. ESPN Radio is presented by Progressive Insurance. Now you can test drive Snapshot to see how much you could save before switching to Progressive. Visit Progressive.com slash Snapshot. When we come back, we're going to talk about food, y'all. It's still Turkey Day. I'm Clint Yates. It's the Dan Levitard Show with Stugatz on ESPN Radio and the ESPN app. Cash more of the Dan Levitard Show with the Stugatz. 10 to 1 Eastern on ESPN Radio and ESPN U. Hi, everyone. Stu Gatz here. Support for the Dan Levitard Show podcast comes from our friends at Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Chances are you are confident when it comes to your work, your hobbies, and your life. Rocket Mortgage gives you the same level of confidence when it comes to buying a home or refinancing your existing home loan. Rocket Mortgage is simple, allowing you to fully understand all the details and be confident you are getting the right mortgage for you. To get started, go to rocketmortgage.com slash Stu That's rocketmortgage.com slash Stugatz, S-T-U-G-O-T-Z, equal housing lender, licensed in all 50 states, nmlsconsumeraccess.org number 3030. I talked last segment or last hour during this segment about the walking around ham. For those of you who are not familiar with a walking around ham, a walking around ham is a ham you have for people to eat while they're walking around at your house waiting for the rest of the food critical to the Thanksgiving Day experience. So let's put it on the poll at ESPN Radio. Does your family have a walking around ham? And if you don't know what a walking around ham is, well, now you know. And if you don't employ a walking around ham, get on it. It's key. Anyway, we're talking about the NFL last segment. We're going to stick with that. Because there's a couple stories around the league right now that are very interesting to me, both relating to quarterbacks, both of which happen to be brothers. Race talk, race talk, party time, excellent. I'm just kidding. We're not going to do all that yet. For those of you who are old, old school listeners and me filling in, you know what that is. But one story that intrigued me a lot is about Cam Newton. It's been a very interesting season for Cam Newton. He had that row, if you will, with the reporter in which he said something that was wildly misogynistic, if you ask me. Like beyond the sort of basic level of disrespect he was showing, where it was rooted was not good. It's also been kind of a weird year for him. They were they didn't play so well the whole season. They haven't always been great on this. But he posted a picture of him with his mug shot from when he was at Florida. People forget about that. Before he went to Auburn, he was at Florida. When he got caught stealing a laptop. 
And he had some very introspective things to say, if you can ever read this, in his bizarro font he chooses to use. Where he talked about it being the lowest point of his life and how he decided from there and then he was never going to have a problem like that. And that changed things. I had sort of forgotten that you can actually see his jumpsuit in this photograph, which he reminds you of. But anyway, I just wanted to say, I've said this before. I think Cam Newton is an emotional guy, which is fine. That is not a knock. I think that he is a dude that as his emotions go, so go the Panthers, which again is not a knock. But it is interesting to see just as a human on earth what his development has been as a human in terms of how he interacts with the general public. Cam Newton is one of not one of those guys that just happens to be a football player. Cam Newton is a large actual person with a great personality who has probably been popular his whole life. So how he grows as a human being is interesting to me to see. And I actually thought this was a very, very thoughtful sort of Thanksgiving holiday post, if you will, in terms of where he's at in his life overall. Close the book on that to something a little less positive. The Buffalo Bills. (laughs) Now, you might recall that the Buffalo Bills, who were formerly of playoff contention in their division, decided just out of the blue they were going to bench Tyrod Taylor. Uh, wh- why? Uh, pff, your guess is as good as mine. Why not put in a rookie who went to Pittsburgh who nobody's ever heard of? Why not sit down the one guy who's out there trying to make your franchise relevant? Y'all remember the last time the Bills were in the playoffs? Let's just say it was the non-HD era. That is all you need to know. I'm fairly certain the last playoff game they were in was the Music City Miracle, and they lost that game. Fairly certain. So for them to be goofing around under center when you actually have a chance to get back for the first time in what is effectively a generation, oh, that means you got some internal problems, folks. That means y'all don't know what you're doing, plain and simple. Speaking of people who don't know what they're doing, let's hear what Sean McDermott, the Bills head coach, had to say about his decision-making process. There will be people that say you wavered on this. Do you think this shows that you didn't make it about yourself and your own ego? It's always about the team. It's always about the team, and and, um, it will always be about the team with me. Oh, really? Really? Well, that's interesting. That is very interesting. So you're going back to Tyrod Taylor after your man's threw five picks and a half? Quite literally, a handful? And it's about the team? Did you, did you poll the team before you asked them if you should bench Tyrod? I'm, I'm guessing no. And the reason why I'm guessing no is probably because you're lying. Because it's not about the team. Speaking of people on the team, let's see what Tyrod had to say about why he thinks he got put down. I personally didn't take my thoughts there. I'm not sure what other guys uh, talked about amongst themselves or whether things were taken toward, uh, towards the coach or not. Like I said, I had to be prepared just in case I was to go into a game and, and still be in tune mentally with the with the preparation throughout the whole week. So I, I never took my thoughts there. This team is very capable of making the playoffs, and we have to go out there each and every week and play um, the way that we know how to play. Sidebar, I shouldn't use the words put down there. I meant to say sat down. Don't at me. Translation on what Tyrod Taylor said. I knew I was the best person for the job, but go ahead. That was one long I told you so. The Buffalo Bills do not deserve Tyrod Taylor at this point. There are not enough starting quarterbacks to go around in the league, period, to be able to consider yourself in a position for success. Never mind the backups. So when you're botching things with the commodities you have to go to the 
obviously less experienced people. You know what it means? It means you don't know how to win in the National Football League. I'm sorry. That's all I can really take away from it. You can listen to the Dan Levatar Show with the Stugats 10 to 1 Eastern on ESPN Radio. And you can watch on ESPNU. We've been talking about the NFL all day long. Joining us right now, Coach Herm Edwards. How you doing, Coach? I am well, my friend. How you doing? I'm tremendous today. All right, I got, they got me, I, I got the blood flow moving. I'm going to Mons after this. Well, then you're good. You tell yes. her I said hello, please. I will do that. I will do that. I know you know she's a fan, so I will do that. So let's start here, though. We're gonna run down the games schedule time wise first. Vikes Lions. What am I expecting out of this game? Because as far as I'm concerned, this will probably actually be the best football matchup of the day with two teams that probably need it the most. Yes, and, and if you think about Detroit, uh, Detroit has put itself in position right now. If they can win this game, obviously, they beat the Minnesota Vikings twice in the season. This was the last time the Vikings actually lost. It was against uh, the Detroit Lions, 14-7, uh, to seven, and then they went on a six-game winning streak. Uh, when you look at both these teams, um, the thing that's, that's kind of glaring, uh, especially uh, Minnesota, is that they've got a quarterback that basically has resurrected his career there. And every week it was, it was questioned, is he the starting quarterback? He has proven he is a starting quarterback. There's okay. no doubt about that. When you look on the other side of it, Matthew Stafford has a wonderful chance um, this season to really put this team on his back like he has done and, and carry them into the playoffs. I mean, he's a quarterback that we know this. In the fourth quarter, this is when he really thrives. And I think if it's a close game in the fourth quarter, look for him – uh, to pull out a victory. They've outscored their opponents 94-41. to 41. So this is a fourth-quarter team. They play at home. It's Thanksgiving. They've beaten the Vikings once before. This, as you said, this, this should be a pretty good football game. Let's move down the line to what I like to call the nap game, <laughs> Chargers-Cowboys. Less of a sexy matchup. The Chargers are under five hundred, and the Cowboys just got blowed out big time by the Eagles last week in what was a very ugly game for that franchise. We talked – to the ESPN Dallas reporter earlier in the day, Stefano Fusaro. And he basically said that without Zeke, you can't really, uh, you know, what, what are you really even doing in terms of how you expect that offense to run? But the offensive line is getting better. What are you expecting to see out of that Cowboys offense that we didn't see last week? Well, they've they got to protect the quarterback. And how do you do that? you got to run the football. And, and when you look at the Chargers, the one thing that they're, they're not very good at is defending the run. They're actually 32nd defending wow. the run. Third so, last. yeah, that's, that's dead last. Last time I just not 33 teams, there's only 32. <laughs> so with that being said, I, I think if you're Dallas, you have to find a way to run the ball and control the game. Uh, and if you can control the game, that you can control their pass rush. With that being said, I think uh, Dak's going to have to move the pocket. They're gonna have, they can't just drop back and throw against these two pass rushes they have in Bosa and obviously Irving. So it's one of those games I think if you can run the football, they have a chance to win this football game. Look. The Chargers need to win this game as well. I mean, they put themselves in position now the last couple of weeks to win some games that when you look at the AFC West, I don't know if they catch Kansas City, but I, I do think this. In the AFC, if you can win nine games, you're probably going to get in as a wild card team. So yeah. it's, it's kind of interesting. The Chargers were halfway looking at this being a successful season, for, you know, a month ago. Yes. You know what I mean? Things have, I'm going to say, fallen apart. But things have gone poorly. I, I mean, do you think this is the team that can turn it around? Or well, I, you know, the Chargers, <laughs> whether you like them or not, the one thing we know about the Chargers when they play, it is interesting in the fourth quarter. They're <laughs> yes. either chasing a lead or they're trying to hold a lead, right? Whatever happens, it comes down to the fourth quarter. Can they make a play to win? And that's kind of been their M.O. the last two years, really. You know, you're talking about games with one score, uh, one score game in the fourth quarter. They've played more than anyone in the National Football League. The bad part is they've lost most of them. Herm Edwards, ESPN NFL analyst, joins us here on the Dan Lebertard Show with Stu Gatz. My name is Clinton Yates, filling in here on a Thanksgiving day. Let me ask you about this, though. The Dak Prescott situation. Yes. He has regressed, but also yeah. no Zeke. Offensive line's a problem. Do you think it's fair, and I asked this question earlier to Stefano Fasaro, who I referred to, and he said, well, do you think it's fair that he gets a full sort of pass on this season from a development standpoint overall? Yeah, because when you think about it, you know, we say he's digressed. Okay, let me ask you this question. 
Is Dez Bryant as good? Yeah. Is Jason Witten as good when the runner's not in the backfield? Yeah. Good question. No, no. <laughs> is the offensive yeah. line as good when the runner's not in the backfield? Right. No. It's the runner. It, the, the runner basically gave everyone an identity because the runner, the whole offense flew and it flowed through the runner for the most part, right? This whole offensive system was the runner, Why? Right? He's a dynamic player. He's the most explosive player they had on the field. With that being said, defensively, when you played the Cowboys last year, even this year when he was playing, your number one concern is what? Stop the runner. What do we have to do? You're going to have to add an eighth element in the box to stop the runner. Guess what? Now the other parts of this offense become a little bit better. Why? Because of the runner. All right. Fair enough. Fair enough. We'll switch gears. Okay. We'll move down to D.C. Oh, boy. We're down <laughs> down at FedEx Field. They're opening up the parking lot 12 hours early. 12 hours early. Eight hours early. That bad boy's open right now. <laughs> I, I set the over-under on turkey fryer explosions at three. I'm now at the under because I'm told that people ain't going to be showing up because they don't want to watch no 4-6 and six team play a 2-8 and eight team, which I believe is probably true. But I'm going to start with last week. It was a devastating loss mm. for the Skins. I mean, watching that, uh, listen, I'm a fan of that team, and I watch week in and week out. I don't necessarily care that much outside of Sundays, but I was big mad when I woke up on Monday morning. What did you see out of that team in terms of how that fourth quarter collapsed and on through the overtime went? Well, they're playing against Drew Brees, and I said this going into that game. I said the thing that scares you about uh, the Saints right now, they have that same formula uh, – that they had when they went to a Super Bowl. They run the ball very well. And in the fourth quarter, when you're playing a guy like Drew Brees, all bets are off, especially at home. So I I think they ran across a team that's got a heck of a winning streak going right now in the Saints. And that's always tough. You know, when you – they've got it right now. That's kind of like that same run they had when they had the Super Bowl. Things just happened. They'd get some, you know, some, some good bounces and some things would go their way. They know how to take advantage of that. I will say this about the quarterback, Kirk Cousins. Um, he's probably smiling right now inside mm. in the fact that however this season ends up, he's going to be sitting in good shape because mm. if Washington does not want to determine he is our quarterback going forward and if they're saying we got to get in the playoffs and win a playoff game uh, for this guy to be the guy, he's probably going to go somewhere else. He's going to have some suitors, oh. right? I, 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 look, look, I, I can sit here right now and close my eyes and go, huh, I wonder what teams, uh, the, 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 the Denver? Oh, no, really? Uh, the Jacksonville? Oh, really? Uh, Arizona. See, everybody's saying San Francisco. I don't know about that because they got yeah. Garoppolo. But all of a sudden, Kirk Cousins is smiling. <laughs> he is what, smiling. What does GM Herm Edwards do in that situation? Well, I thought they should have done this a while back. I mean, he's your guy. Uh, he's he is he is in great concert with the head coach. He has a great feel for the offense. Um, you know, I, I don't know. I, I don't know. You look. I understand. You know, sometimes because of who he is, and you know more than anybody, yeah. the money that these guys are asking for now, it just it can affect your whole team in the sense that when you pay a quarterback the money that he's probably going to get somewhere, whether it's in Washington or somewhere else, you disable your franchise in, in free agency. Your free agency is over. So you have to become very efficient in drafting players and developing players. And that's what the quarterback does to, to teams now. It hampers them. Look what happened to New Orleans when they signed Drew for all that money. For a couple of years, it took them a while before they could build their team back. Why? You can't go out in free agency. You're not getting those quality guys. You don't have the money. You have to actually draft well, which which I kind of like. I, I would prefer you draft your players anyway and develop them. I've, I've always felt that way. So it, it, that, that's what it forces teams to do. All right. Last football question. The Giants are the, who they're playing. So I didn't <laughs> want to ask about them because they sorry. But they beat the Chiefs. They did. Which was a weird win. But the Chiefs made a midweek acquisition move. Why did the Chiefs sign Darrell Revis? What is that about? Well, he knows the system. Bob had him up there when he was with the Jets. Uh, now he's a year away from playing. How they use him, I, I think he's a he's a part time player, pro- probably early. Um, do they use him outside or in the slot? You know they've struggled 
you know, this, this chief defense is, is, you know, if it doesn't take the ball away, it doesn't get off the field. Uh, they, they don't, you know, they don't rush the passer extremely well. Uh, you know, so they get a guy, their secondary is a little bit beat up. They've got some young players playing back there. Beside Peters, he's their best player. They lost their safety. We know that. So they, they have corner issues and nickel issues. It'll be interesting to me where they use Revis. Do they use him inside as a nickel guy? Or they, do they keep him outside as a slot guy? It's going to be interesting how they use him. And this is what I would worry about. He's an older player, hadn't played in a year. I would worry about injury. Yeah. I mean, you know, he's not, he's not playing like a position where he doesn't move. You're playing in the secondary, a reactionary position. And if he's not ready to go, uh, he could end up getting hurt. One word answer, coach. Last thing I'll ask you when it comes to cranberry sauce, homemade or canned? Homemade. Stop it. <laughs> he's the coach, Herb Edwards, ESPN NFL analyst. Thank you, Herb. You're welcome. You can listen to the Dan Levatar Show with the Stugats 10 to 1 Eastern on ESPN Radio, and you can watch on ESPNU. You can always count on Bud Light, just like you can always count on Tailgate Terry. Without Tailgate Terry, you wouldn't have cold Bud Lights and seven-layer dip at every pregame. That's 56 layers per season. Just the right amount if you ask Terry. Tailgate Terry is famous among friends. He deserves a Bud Light. Enjoy responsibly Bud Light beer. A.B. St. Louis, Missouri. The Heat is not who he plays for anymore. He plays for the Cleveland Cavaliers. And you know the coach of the Cleveland Cavaliers is? Tyron Lue. Now, the relationship between these two has been a very interesting one over the course of their time there. Because Tyron was basically handpicked by LeBron, in case you forgot that. They went through a couple people, and LeBron was like, nah, nah, that's what we got. So now, when they have any sort of, I don't want to say dispute, but you know, when grown, grown folks talking to each other kind of situation, there's always a tendency to read it as, well, what does this mean? Where is this going as far as the two of them are concerned? Now, Braun last night got popped in the face. That wasn't good. But he came back and he scored a whole bunch of points. And they ended up winning the game. Let's hear what Tyron Lue had to say about Braun's little running. Do you think LeBron getting hit in the mouth or whatever kind of woke him up a little bit? Good. Yeah, it was good? Yes. <laughs> Why? Because he was messing around. And told him at halftime, you're messing around. He got a little upset, and that's good. Get hit again. <laughs> oh, is that John Cena face meme? That gif. No, I'm just kidding. It's not that serious. But I do like what he had to say there. Tom Ron Lou ain't afraid of LeBron James. And he shouldn't, shouldn't be. I actually genuinely love their relationship in terms of how they communicate with each other. It ain't all this tiptoeing around and all this other foolishness. They talk to each other like grown men. Let's hear LeBron responding on that from Ty Lue. I mean, whatever T. Lue say goes, so, you know, he knows how to challenge me sometimes. And, uh, you know, after the dunk, you know, and then I came up and pulled a 4-3. That was a bad shot. Um, but they felt like the other one was a bad shot as well. The one in the corner, he said big and called a timeout after that point. And, you know, kind of took the life out of the team. So I know it starts and ends with me. So uh, I got to be, you know, I got to be better, uh, which I was. I was a lot better in the second half. And that's sort of the whole point here, is that as LeBron ages and these minutes start to add up, you know, we're talking about a team that's out here doing all sorts of different things in terms of their travel schedule to make sure that everybody is rested. This is a legitimate part of how they're operating now. It's taking into consideration LeBron's workload. He's not playing as many minutes. You know, people are trying to act like that's a side factor. That's a main factor, but not just in terms of, you know, who's making the decision, in terms of how it's going to affect the gameplay. That said, as LeBron's physical skills go, and I'm not saying they have gone, not remotely. Don't be taking that out of context, talking about I'm saying LeBron is washed. That is not remotely what I'm getting at. But what I'm saying is that, As he ages in the NBA, his relationships with his coaches are going to become more important. Why? Because when you start to lose things or you are a step off 
physically, it affects the way you think about the game in terms of what you're able to execute. So for LeBron to be open enough to hear his coach say, you know what, that wasn't the best decision. And him saying, you know what, you're right, fam. My B, I'm going to do better next time. That's a healthy relationship, y'all. That's a very good thing if you're a Cavs fan. Because it means that not only is Lou saying what he needs to say for the purposes of the squad getting better. He's saying it for the purposes of trying to train LeBron to think a little bit differently about how he approaches the team game. It ain't always just going to be takeover mode, even if it was that last night. They have a very healthy relationship. They got a grown man relationship. Speaking of grown man relationships, though. That Kevin Durant, Russell Westbrook situation. Oh, yeah, that's a real grown man situation. The hands community wants to know where that relationship is going. Last night they got into it. Little forehead touching. Couple of look back. To, I, 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 don't, don't, don't be, don't be, don't be, don't, that, that. There's a whole lot of that. Royce Young, ESPN NBA Thunder reporter, said on Izzy in Spain, yeah, they ain't boys no more. The most Kevin Durant and Russell Westbrook talk to each other is the uh, little sequences of trash talk when they play against each other, because that's it. I mean, these two guys, um, there is no relationship between them anymore. And um, obviously that's kind of a sad thing. I mean, these guys spent a lot of time together, got very, very close, a lot of respect and admiration for the other. Um, but, you know, you can, you can see it on the floor tonight, the way just Russell Westbrook reacts um, to any time he's around Durant. Um, I mean, the guy just wants to annihilate him. And, I mean, Russell certainly holds a grudge. A.K.A. ain't no love lost. Oh, well. It was a great game last night. Thunder got their signature win of the season. Put them back on the right track. And might kick the Warriors in a little bit of a gear in terms of what can happen if they don't have it all there on any particular night. Lastly, speaking of love lost, I got to give a shout out to my man Patrick Beverly. For those of you who watch me on Around the Horn, you know that one of the players that I dressed up as for Halloween was Patrick Beverly. I love Patrick Beverly. I am the president of the Patrick Beverly fan club. Patrick Beverly won a dunk contest in the Ukraine. You ain't know that. Patrick Beverly is my dude because Patrick Beverly plays basketball the way I enjoy watching people play basketball. Loud, in your face, and physical. No matter what. Very annoying. Very persistent. And very effective. But Patrick Beverly ain't playing no more this season. He's got a torn meniscus in his right knee and he's out for the year. Which not only means the Clippers season is done though, But that means we don't get to watch Patty Beverly anymore, man. I'm bummed out about that. That was right after he had just called out the team for needing to get meaner in order to be successful. And alas, his body let him down. Quite frankly, this is very personally devastating. Patrick Beverly, we're rooting for you, fam. NBA ain't the same without you. You can listen to the Dan Levatar Show with the Stugats 10 to 1 Eastern on ESPN Radio, and you can watch on ESPNU. My name is Clinton Yates, if you don't know that. I write for The Undefeated. You can see me on Around the Horn during the week. And you can hear me on weekends starting in December with one Mina Kimes and Dominique Foxworth. Mina's also on Around the Horn. Mina also writes for ESPN the magazine. And Mina also learned something new about black Twitter on Thanksgiving last year as a result of her food choices. We're not even going to get into that, Mina. I'm not going to put you through that. But I am going to wow. ask you off top what your feelings are on the cranberry sauce debate because I have very strong feelings, but I need to know yours. Oh, I don't. I wish I looked up yours before coming on because I feel like this is a sneak attack. But I it's will say I, I'm okay with cranberry sauce. I, I like it. And, and mostly because I think turkey is kind of bland. So whatever spices up turkey is fine with me. 
Are you canned or homemade? Oh, well, I didn't really have the option of homemade in my house, so... Thank you. Uh, I don't have a preference. Mina on the right side of the history, though, Ooh. knowing full well that canned cranberry sauce is better. Sidebar, I didn't realize this game was kicking off at 1230, and my fantasy team is in a situation right now. Anyway, um, <laughs> <laughs> that is a bit of a problem. Anyway, uh, okay, so let me ask you this. Overall, we're going to go over some of these food takes. I saw some guys say that mac and cheese was a disaster, and my overall opinion on mac and cheese is that if mac and cheese is making or breaking your meal, you probably yeah. don't have a very good meal to begin with. I said that mac and cheese is sort of like the Volvo of Thanksgiving foods. Like, you know, there's some fly Volvos out there. But for the most part, they're safe cars. What are your thoughts on mac that's, and cheese? That's fair. Um, I, I, I dropped my sides take earlier, which is that all sides, I think, are pretty good. It's right. Turkey is by far inferior to the sides on Thanksgiving. You know, turkey is just to deliver the gravy and the cranberry sauce. But I, I like all Thanksgiving sides, to be honest. Like, I'll rank them, but they're all pretty good. Yeah. All right. We're talking with Mina Kimes, ESPN the Magazine reporter, Around the Horn panelist, my co-host on the Morning Roast on ESPN Radio. Now, the other thing I brought up is this before we get to football. <laughs> a walking, the walking around ham. Are you familiar with what a walking around ham is? Uh, no, a walking around ham. Yes, I do. It sounds like you. No, <laughs> that, that is very correct. But no, the purpose of a walking around <laughs> ham is a ham for people to eat while they're walking around the house. Like if you got a big house, you don't want people interfering in the kitchen operation. So you have what's known as a walking around ham, so people can pluck off a little bit of the ham and keep it moving around the area without bogging down what's going on in the kitchen. Does this have? Do you have anything of the sort in your household or in your family? Uh, no, that sounds heavy and a little burdensome. But I guess, I guess logistically, it kind of makes sense. All right, not only doing Thanksgiving right, but anyway, I know you're out there on the West Coast. I know it's early. What we just yeah, kicked off, Lions. Really yeah. What are you looking for today in terms of football? In terms of uh, the best storylines? Well, we're starting with the game of the day right now, um, yeah. which you know this is. I picked the Vikings. I think maybe all of my colleagues who do the expert picks on ESPN.com, go check them out, perhaps pick the Vikings. I can check that. Um, you know, they were just so impressive coming off of that. Oh, no, we got a couple Lions picks in there. Lewis Riddick, who's much better at picking games than me. So, uh, but, but I will say, you know, the Vikings is a question so far this season. We know the defense is good. We know they have, you know, quite a few pro bowlers on that side of the ball. But can Case Keenum keep it up? Can he continue having – this year that is so counter to what we know, because he's not an unknown, you know, he's not even like a Jared Goff where he's taking a step up. We right. knew who Case Keenum was. And then all of a sudden he's a completely different guy. So I would, I thought last week would be his comeuppance. I thought he would revert to his turnover throwing self and, and he didn't. And Clinton, a lot of that has to do with, you know, he's got two of the best weapons in the NFL and a line that appears to be playing at a much higher level than before. What about the second game? The nap game, as I like to call it, which is a very East Coast biased way to refer to that game. But it's also not exactly the best sit down. It's Chargers. It's Cowboys. The Chargers at some point thought their season was going to take off. It sort of crumbled there. And the Cowboys obviously got dump trucked last week. What do you see in that game? Yeah. This is another. This one was really divisive. I'm looking at the picks. I picked the Chargers. But, um, you know, the Chargers are a weird team because – Honestly, this year and last year, they've been better than their record. You know, they have this comical or tragic comical, depending on who you're rooting for, tendency to lose in close games. Um, but they have this, like, amazing pass rush in both on Ingram, obviously Philip Rivers, tons of weapons. They should be good, but they find ways to lose. And then you've got the Cowboys, who, as you mentioned, are just heavily diminished right now. Uh, Tyron Smith is going to be playing the left tackle, and that should be huge for them. Sean Lee's still out. Obviously, Zeke's still out. So this is not the Cowboys at their full power, which is, I think, why everyone's so split on this game. What do you think about Dak in terms of his development? I talked to Herm earlier in the show, and he said yeah. he's given him basically a full pass on development for the entire season, which I thought he's was great. interesting. Yeah, I'm with him. Man, I, I think he's fantastic. And I, it's funny, I feel like people now, and we see this all the time with quarterbacks, 
you know, who are about the same age. We saw with, I remember, Russell Wilson and Andrew Luck. And it, the rise of Carson Wentz, people seem to think, means, oh, Dak is declining. And that's just insane. Anyone who's watched games this year sees that he is incredible. At times, he has carried this offense. You know, if you just look at his statistics, I think he's second in QBR, maybe. And true, Wentz is having a better season. But Dak Prescott is still one of the best quarterbacks in the NFL right now, he's just struggled with some of those injuries and, you know, not especially Tyrone Smith, which is, I think, probably more impactful than the absence of Ezekiel Elliott. Last thing I'm going to ask you, Mina, my boys. <laughs> oh, no. They got the night. That is exactly what Herm said when I brought it up. He said, oh, boy, you said, oh, no, and now I'm feeling <laughs> terrible about this. They duffed out against the Saints in a game that made me so upset that I could – I was – Look, yeah. you, know, you know how I feel about football. I am not normally angry beyond the day. I woke up upset on Monday because of that loss. Number one, what do you think about that in terms of the Saints? And number two, what do you think we're going to see tonight versus the Giants? Well, I should hope they can beat the Giants. But, you know, what bummed me out so much was the loss of Chris Thompson because you wouldn't think like a situational running back would be one of, if not maybe the most important player in the offense. But I really – felt that way about him you know what a weapon he was just the package they were able to run with him he was so athletic so talented and to lose him I think could be really devastating for this offense which is a shame because I think Kirk's having a great season I think he's really you know earning those future dollars um and it's disappointing to lose him I, I it'll be interesting I'm more than this game, because it really doesn't matter, right? And the Giants, you know, are the Giants. I'm interested in seeing how the offense moves on without him. <sighs> I'm going to have to watch that game. I just have to. I'm going to watch it, of course. I know. I mean, Who you I'm got? Just, I mean, I, you know, the best 4-6 and six team in the league is the best 4-6 and six team in the league. i got to think yeah. they're going to win. Because if they don't, the few they people that to. showed up for that game are going to burn the place down. I mean, come on. <laughs> if you can't win that game... You know, you, you have to mail in the rest of the season, and you already sort of have it anyway, and that's a whole other mm. discussion. But, yeah, I think this can't be mm. going to win. So, Is Kirk that. back next year, Clinton? Tell me, yes or no? Transition tag. Block Oh! <laughs> you didn't know I had that. <laughs> anyway, that's all I got. She's Mina Kimes. You can see her on Around the Horn. You can hear her on ESPN Radio with me and Dominic Foxworth on The Morning Rose, and you can read her work in ESPN The Magazine. Mina, say what up to Chief Ike and Lenny and the rest of your family for me, and have a happy Thanksgiving. See you soon, bud. Cash more of the Dan Levatar Show with the Stugats, 10 to 1 Eastern on ESPN Radio and ESPNU.